Yeah. Okay. I'd like to call to order the Avalon City Council meeting of September 4th, and we will also be acting as the Housing Authority. Can you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you would just stand for a moment to remember Andrea Moran, a mother and grandmother, uh, resident of Avalon for years, and, and also a niece of, of Dudley Moran. Also, a moment of silence for Senator John McCain and a favorite of mine, Aretha Franklin. Please be seated. Roll call, please. Council Member Albers. Present. Council Member Hernandez. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Cassidy. Here. And Mayor Marshall. Here. And for the record, Council Member Olson is absent. Okay. And we have two presentations this evening. The first one I will read. And unfortunately, they will not be here, but we told them we'd read it to the record and we have sent it to them as well. A proclamation of the City Council of the City of Avalon recognizing September 2018 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection report cancer is the leading cause of death by disease among U.S. children between infancy and age 15. This tragic disease is detected in more than 15,000 of our country's young people each and every year. And whereas one in five of our nation's children loses his or her battle with cancer. Many infants, children, and teens will suffer from long-term effects of comprehensive treatment, including secondary cancers. And whereas founded nearly 25 years ago by Stephen Firestein, a member of the, the philanthropic Max Factor Cosmetics Company family, the American Cancer Fund for Children, Inc. and Kids Cancer Connection, Inc. are dedicated to helping these children and their families. And whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection provided a variety of vital patient psychosocial services to children undergoing cancer treatment at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, Cedar sinai Medical Center, the City of Hope, UCLA Mattel, Mattel Children's Hospital, Jonathan Hawkes Children's Cancer Center at Miller Children's and Women's Hospital Long Beach, LA, County USC Medical Center, Harbor USC Medical Center, as well as participating hospitals throughout the country, thereby enhancing the quality of life for these children and their families. And whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection also sponsor Courageous Kid Recognition Awards, Family Sailing Programs, Pet Assisted Therapy, KCC Supercar Experience, and Hospital Celebrations in honor of a child's determination and bravery to fight the battle against childhood cancer. Now therefore, the City Council of the City of Avalon would like to thank Kid Cancer Connection for all their support in honoring and encouraging those living with cancer and encouraging our citizens to raise an awareness about the prevention and control of cancer. Dated this fourth day of September by the Avalon City Council. And all right, this evening we have uh, two gentlemen here from the county. The first one is Acting Chief Lifeguard Fernando Boto. I hope I said his name correctly. And then our local Steve Powell. I'm sorry, Steve, I don't know your title. Captain Powell. Captain, Captain. Powell. Thank you. They are here at the invite of the mayor. Hi, good evening. Uh, uh, we were asked to come up just to discuss briefly the uh, float operations, uh, the, the lifeguard operations on the float. Just kind of give a quick update. So our normal procedure for um, for the float during the summer when the float is put in in mid-June is to have two lifeguards down at South Beach. Um, as things get busy throughout the day, we'll have one lifeguard out on a paddleboard just kind of right on top of the float basically to kind of address issues that are going on and then one lifeguard on South Beach to kind of watch everything else that's happening. Obviously our, our uh, primary uh, goal is to provide water safety down there. Occasionally the float when there's problems pushing and shoving, a lot of rough housing takes up a lot of our effort. So we try to kind of try to stave that stuff off as, as best as possible. So by having a lifeguard on the paddleboard right on the float, that's proved to be a pretty effective uh, a way of handling this. 
the flow was put in last summer, so we've been kind of going through an evolution of trying to figure out how the, to best manage this process to keep it safe out there. And I think we've come up with a pretty good, a pretty good plan. Um, we try to enforce all the ordinances that are being broken, pushing, shoving, people running around like crazy. If the flow gets too crowded, we'll just shut it down temporarily, kind of send everybody in. Uh, if we have a lot of problems, we have a big group that goes out there and really causing trouble. We've got a couple of different plans we can put in place. One is we'll call Harbor down. They bring a boat up right outside the float, turn the light on. It's very effective how that gets people to really shut up really quickly. <laughs> They'll call, we'll call extra people down there and just kind of, kind of clear the whole area out to try to make it safe again. Um, the, um, we're trying to catch problems as they occur. We do get complaints from parents and visitors about pushing. We ask them to please let us know what's happening. We can't see everything. We can't hear everything that's going on. Let us know what's happening and we'll try to address it. Uh, the float, the way it's set up in Avalon, I've looked at several of the other agencies that run similar floats on the mainland. Ours is different. Long Beach, for example, has a dock that goes from the beach with a gate, and there's only one access point for the float. They can actually shut that dock off, close the gate, and nobody else can go out there. So they can control the access to the float, and they only let a certain amount of people on at a time, and then they clear it and let another group on. That's how they run their float. We don't have a system like that because it's on the beach. Uh, where everybody can just kind of come and go. So we have to manage it differently. The, um, uh, we try to catch the repeat offenders. We have a group that likes to go out there and cause trouble regularly. We know who they are and we're trying to continue to address it. <laughs> Next summer, I think we're gonna spend the first week uh, very aggressively trying to set the stage for how it's gonna be, you know, really crack the whip early and I think that that'll help. Um, I've been in contact regularly with uh, Dan Recreation to try to, how can we make things better, what's working, what's not working. We actually took out one section of the float that just was causing too much trouble. Once we took that out, things got a little bit better. So we're in regular communication on that stuff. Uh, next year, and I'll work with Dan on things we can improve. Uh, a couple things I suggest is maybe a, the two major access points at South Beach are the two stairways. We could put up a sign at each stairway perhaps, just you know, saying, look, no pushing, no shoving, obey the lifeguard, that type of thing. So people just walk right by and say, okay, here's what the rules are. And maybe another suggestion is to, when we're ready to put in the float at the end of the school year, maybe go talk to the kids at the school and say, hey, here's, we're going to put this in, we're ready to go, we want everybody to have a nice, fun, safe summer, but here's the expectation. And if we have problems, we're just going to have to pull the float or just, you know, um, just to try to maybe st stop those problems before they occur. Sure. Um, but that's kind of how we manage the float. It's a two-person operation down there. We rotate our lifeguards through, so they get a couple of days at South Beach and then go spend a day at North Beach relaxing and talking to all the locals and enjoying <laughs> themselves and come back to South Beach and do that. So that's uh, kind of float 101. No, that's great. That's great. Um, I appreciate the seriousness in which you, the seriousness in which everybody takes their job, including yourself as you're giving this presentation. Mm -hmm. But I, I think they've also, kind of, some of those lifeguards have also kind of made it fun for them too. So, so mm -hmm. you've got a good staff down there. They're, they're doing a great job. I know the first year was, was a real learning curve mm -hmm. and, um, and then this one, and, and they already put things in place that you've stated that have, have made it safer. Mm -hmm. um, I personally haven't gotten a lot of complaints. I just wanted to say, Thank you for what you do, um, and, and thank all your staff. The other thing is, though, do you have any real, like, lifeguard rescues? Are there any truly lifeguard rescues you do, do during the summer? We do, uh, yeah. We have, the one thing about the float is it draws a lot of people who are not very good swimmers, and we do make a, a number of rescues, especially at the beginning of summer. I, I could get a count for you if you'd like. We keep not statistics on everything, but we all. do. We, we actually... Yeah. And that's the thing is it's, it's important that with the two-person operation, we don't want to lose focus of the fact that there's a bunch of kids in the water down there. So we really need right. to focus on that primary goal, which is to make sure everybody's safe down there and not have the float, uh, what's going on in the float, take away from, from the important stuff, which is, and we try to tell people, sometimes we don't catch everything. You know, we, we miss people doing things on the float and we ask, tell us if people are doing something because our real priority is making sure nobody's, nobody's drowning. You know? right. So that's Please. Can I just add one th uh, quick thing? Uh, so part of our job is to prevent things from happening. So what the personnel here does is, uh, uh, you know, advise the folks to avoid getting in this bad situations that we have to have a serious rescue. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Prevention is the best, the better part. 
Yeah, and JJ, I think, wants to say something. As uh, Cap referred to, this, this was a learning experience, and there's, we have a lot of playthings in one small area, and so perhaps maybe next year, instead of having that big piece of uh, um, float out there, we split it up, have a section further towards the, uh, the, the mole area in the swim lines, one area, and then over um, towards the, the pier um, for another area. But that one long, huge uh, float really creates an issue. And again, we we've, have sent our boats over there to, to back up the, the lifeguards. And, and once they see us come over there with the lights on and stuff, they, you know, it, it, we're all for clearing the beach, clearing the float, you know, mm -hmm. time out type deal because it, as you can tell throughout the, the summer with the, with the injuries and all, there's things, you know, the things happen, we gotta slow it down. So right. okay. it, um, I fully support uh, the, the Baywatch and the lifeguards and whatever we can do to, to make that happen and work with Dan to make that happen, but we gotta reconfigure some things, I think. So that's something we'll take a good close look at next, uh, yeah. before next summer. Great, well thank you. Somebody, please have some questions or comments because they came all this way and we wanna keep them here for a while. <laughs> Thank Good you. Job. Yeah. Well, thank you for the kind words. I'll pass on our lifeguards. I'm, I'm okay. proud of how what they've done down there too. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you. Well. Let's hear it. Thank you. thank you. Okay. Are there any announcements or written communications? I just wanted to let the audience know that uh, the next city council meeting will be starting an hour early. I think I've heard back from four of you and that was okay and we'll be having a closed session item from four to five and then we'll be starting the regular council meeting at five o'clock. And we are still waiting to hear back from uh, several people I believe for the joint uh, meeting of the planning commission and the city council to discuss uh, conditional use permits. And that would be on Wednesday the 19th from 4.30 to six before the planning commission meeting. Okay, great. May we have a department head report. Good evening, Bob Greenlaw, Director of Public Works. A couple of quick items tonight. So as we finish up Labor Day, we're really not truly over with summer here yet, but this is the time that we come out and we start trying to get our projects going as we get uh, less visitors toward the waterfront. So we're ramping up for those activities here. In the near future, as we say, it's you know November, December is really we've got to get ready right now to get those things done. You're seeing a couple of the agenda items tonight. That the mole phase one, you have the plans in front of you, which and also getting out to bid, and you'll see a lot of activity once we get that bid and actually start construction. And then um, of course the sewer lateral up at 206 East Whitley is not on the waterfront, but you know that's another set of plans in front of you. So it's just another. Set of effort that we're doing with engineering and also bids and construction to get that done. Um, the Casino Way restrooms are ramping up. We almost got all the parts for that, and then we would go out and get those subcontractor bids to be able to get that work done for those pieces that our own crews can. So understand that the, the pieces that our own crews are doing is really for a training exercise to show them how to do some of this because it is a smaller project how to be able to get in there and do some of those construction activities that they do need some more training on, okay? And then we also received notice that um, our reclaimed water planning study grant is being recommended to advance to the next level. So that's the, um, probably the 75, 75, dollars $75, $75, match that would be at the wastewater treatment plant that really the intent of that is to set us up for future grant funds once we get that data is get the products, the engineering products and the data from that and then once we have that and we analyze that, bring that to council if we decide to move forward in that direction or in that piece of the water puzzle is in our toolbox that we're set up for those grant funds. But additionally what it does is it sets us up for helping us redo our wastewater treatment plant and our other uh, collection facilities because it's all part of that and it's all part of that study. So um, those things help us to build that um, 5, 10, 15, 20 year CIP that we need for, for water. Okay, and then we also, um, we did receive a cost estimate for uh, the additional parking at Vaughn. So this next time around I'll be bringing up 
um, that additional parking uh, over there in front of the island company's property right next to Vaughn's there that would um, put 20 diagonal spaces there on the side that Vaughn's is and so and once I get all that neatly packaged up and the plans that were part of the plans for the project and that and that cost estimate then we can have a discussion if we want to uh, be a good idea to move forward with that at this time okay any questions um, my recollection is that the bid um, specification or the, the technical specifications from Acorn came into you on August 3rd any progress on the bid documents yeah on that and, and uh, definitely I you know that's on the priority list and I'm sorry that I haven't right. got to I, that I was yet. I know the that they, did we have bid documents for the elevator yes not okay, the, so the, no not the elevator the we, contract terms I mean just the basic contract terms because the specifications are like one page it's a off-the-shelf stair lift basically um, right well it is a public works contract and so the specifications um, are not one page what I received from acorn and then that's that's part of what the contract is is what we put out to bid right but the bid documents are pretty okay. standard and and so right. I put a bid package together a federal set of bid documents together that um, once that's um, that and that was for the um, stair lift the, the right. lift platform lift, the platform lift versus right. a chair lift okay and so that's what we're using um, the chair lift and because we had no bidders on the platform lift and um, it became apparent that um, the complex would accept a stair lift instead because what we heard um, at in the public comment here is that there was some residents that were concerned that they couldn't carry groceries up in that stair lift and so that's why um, we went with the elevator lift that's how that was packaged together um, so now we're at the point where We've got the, and we had to reach out to, to both the West Coast and the East Coast, right. and we did receive that, and yes, I have that in hand, and yes, it's me as the engineer besides the Public Works Director to put that together <coughs> for that project. So that's why I just have a lot on my plate. I, and, I know you do. Yeah. I guess it's a question of trying to yeah. indicate yeah. that in terms of priority, on it's on my list, yeah. and I, I just respectfully, I've worked on lots of public contract jobs and this might be an opportunity for you to hand it off to, to somebody else because the bid documents are not going to change it's the specifications that are going to change and the specifications on this are, are it's an off-the-shelf item primarily other than the railing to fit the stairs so I, I'm just I, I I'm hoping that when we come back at the next meeting we can report I'll make sure progress. that it's at the next meeting so that you'll you'll have that thank you that kind of brings my curiosity up a little bit do, how long has this project been going on? We've been talking about the. <laughs> well, well the it's lift. evolved, though. Let's be fair. Okay, no, I'm just were, asking. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm it, just trying about when we started this. Three years ago. Three years ago. Three years ago. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. it started with the elevator, then it went to the lift, and now okay. we're at yeah, the. Yeah. Okay. Then it changed the over to the lift. side chair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just asking. Yeah. No, it, it's been around. Just asking. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Council. Um, this weekend, uh, Labor Day weekend, the harbor was packed. West Harbor and Descanso was packed. We, we had uh, over uh, 353 boats that uh, were on our moorings um, for the three-day holiday, which was a good thing. <clears throat> Everybody, and my hat's off to Dan and to um, Chief Krug on the fireworks. I mean, hear nothing but great praises <laughs> about the fireworks thing. Yeah. So we all have you know what? So the boaters are making an attempt to stop and say, you know, I had one boater today tell me that it, his, they've been coming here for 42 years. His daughter was in, in diapers, and it was the best fireworks show um, that they've ever seen over here. So it's going to be interesting. They keep it up for the fourth, but I, I hope they do. Well, you can start soliciting for funds now, now that everybody's so high on fireworks. Yeah, yeah. It'll be this interesting to see what the cost of that was, that because that was that was pretty tremendous. No, it was, it was pretty good. Um, this weekend coming up, we have our outrigger race. Um, we're expecting close to 60 boats, um, support boats, and um, the the outriggers. Not 60 outriggers. It'll probably be about 25 or 30 outriggers. But um, it's a really big weekend. And Saturday they come in and. It, 
it looks like a you know a bee's nest out there and then all of a sudden it calms down until Sunday morning when everybody's trying to you know get out and get in the way so um, we're, we're looking forward to that and just uh, um, a reminder that um, our uh, winter rates take effect starting October 15th and uh, go through June 15th and so um, it's where you pay for four and get three free so um, no major issues over the weekend we've had a couple people um, that have fallen off their boats late at night that um, managed to get back on their boats probably a little bit of spirits going back and forth but um, <laughs> anyway uh, unless you have any questions that's, that's basically all I have JJ I have one question for you regarding the change of the mooring rates um, is there has there been any outreach to the public to or or local boaters if you will that are here year-round I don't even know how you would do that but I'm no, just curious I mean, if you had a mechanism in the past every um, every July is the we put a fee structure together and we submit it and I think last year or two years ago we had one boater that was upset because they went uh, from the five and two to, to four and three but uh, and, and quite honestly I haven't heard nobody's come to me and said hey you've doubled the deal and it, it unfortunately there's a lot of there's a lot of projects that need to get done there's a mm -hmm. lot of things and it's it's gonna cost and it's it's it, we raised our prices three I think 3.5 percent to the nearest dollar and that was it so it just because we ran into issues where we don't raise them for five years and all of a sudden they try to raise them 10 percent and then everybody comes out of the woodwork so right. if we could just try to stay on a CPI is you know mm -hmm. the best I thought so um, but no I you know they know it they know they're gonna their boats are gonna be there and it's still cheaper than pulling their boats out of the water and going to Caleb's so right. and city since it is part of our fee schedule we do publicly um, advertise it in the paper as a public hearing so that's all part of our fees yeah the the comment that uh, came to me was you the city council have doubled the mooring fees and and it was just really hard at the moment I had a hard time explaining it and then I when I started getting into it I started you know hey we have a lot that we need to do and these are the reasons why and we didn't technically double the mooring rates it's only those three months in the winter that instead of going two for five we're just staying at four for three, four. Four four for three. three. yeah so um, I I just I felt like I didn't have really solid response to you doubled the mooring fees and and that's why I'm well, saying was there at some point in time I think you did call the harbor and uh, evidently I wasn't there and you talked to Cheryl so yeah she explained you know, it she to me explained it to you yeah. so um, anytime anybody has a, a question regarding the harbor don't hesitate to give me a call uh, I, as you can tell I, I have no problem talking <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm there for you I, I mean I work for you guys so you know if any any question about okay. it whatsoever thank you okay nope I gotta come up with one. Oh, okay. So, so I was uh, met some people a woman within the last week or so. They were talking about the incident where the woman was was she getting off the cyclone onto the pier and fell into the water. Correct. She okay. got off the cyclone onto the float, and she just kept walking, walked right off the float into the water. Okay. So, the, the, so the, the comment was made, and it's, I'm not directing you at all, no. but I, but I but they said. Why aren't there life, those life rings around because there was nothing to throw to her? Do, are they, who's responsible, should the cyclone have those so they can? Well, they have them on their board, the boats, but there's no saying, there's nothing saying that we can't put them on the, the handrail and throw it to them. We've, we've added ladders to every float out there, so in case somebody falls in the water, they can come, we can put the ladder down, they can climb yeah. up the ladder. Yeah. But I, I can make that happen in a heartbeat. That's not an no, issue. No, I'm not, I'm not directing, I'm just waiting if no, y'all no, want to go it, home and talk about it. And it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, we have yeah. them on the mall. Because then whoever the is rail. there could, anybody could help. Exactly. Exactly. And, so just and that, that's a really inexpensive fix. Okay. So, just, I mean, just and, and a few things. So. We'll, we'll make sure that that happens. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council, City staff. Hi. Uh, Labor Day was very successful for us. There were quite a number of calls for service. Uh, no truly significant incidents. 
uh, with regards to the fireworks show. Whether the show goes badly or it goes very well, I can't claim any responsibility for that <laughs> outside of the safety of the event. Uh, it was a terrific opportunity for the harbor and the fire department to work together uh, for the safety of the show. Uh, on a personal level, I thought the content of the show was terrific, and I think Dan can speak more to that. Uh, but that went uh, very successfully. Uh, on Saturday, we also, some of the department heads, myself, the mayor, and the mayor pro tem attended the Yacht Club's end of season ceremony. And I'd like to thank them. They've made a very generous donation of the Gordy McLean Fund for the fire department. Nice. And with that, that's all I have, unless you have questions for me. You're good. You're good. Thank right, you. Thank you. I don't have very much this uh, evening. Our three projects are all doing very well. We had our department, our weekly department head meeting last Wednesday on the Vaughn site, and they gave us a tour of the building. It's really coming together on the inside, so it's kind of exciting to actually see it starting to look like the inside of a store. Um, there was one other thing I was gonna say. Oh, we should have the schedule for our community outreach meetings for our LCP update. It should be up on the website here in the next few days. And as we go forward with having those um, community outreach meetings and our stakeholder meetings for our LCP update. So, any questions for me? Okay. I do. <clears throat> so, commercial vehicles. So, okay. so I guess it's, it's all, it, let me back, on a broader scale. If a contractor, if somebody is having a project done, a big project, okay. uh, and vehicles come over mm -hmm. for those projects, mm -hmm. is there any responsibility on the part of the big business to tell the little guys and the subcontractors how to behave and what they need to do when they're coming here in terms of business licenses and, and uh, vehicle permits and things like that? I would, is there a legal requirement? I would think. I mean, how does anybody know? Maybe. I think the, the general contractor has a responsibility to advise his subs of what the rules are, where they're going to be doing their work. And the general contractors are all told that any vehicles that they're bringing over require vehicle permits. Their subcontractors are all required to get city business licenses. If their subcontractors are bringing over vehicles, they're required to get special vehicle permits, and they're all told that those commercial vehicles have to be parked off the street at night. Um, at the very end of a project, when we're ready to issue a certificate of occupancy, we will go through our files, we will get a list of subcontractors, and anyone that hasn't been getting their license as they go along, we try to stay on top of it as we go so that there's not a huge list at the very end. They'll, they'll be required to come in and get their city business license. But if they've brought a vehicle on and off without us catching them, well, well, we'd never know. Yeah, you would. Well, that's true, no, I they guess, could, of any no, vehicle. They, but they could fall through the cracks, I guess, is what yes, I'm saying. Yes, but they should all have the special vehicle sticker on them. Yeah. And so, just like any other vehicle that doesn't have a proper sticker code would notice that they're parked on the street and yeah. they don't have and the there are, permit. So I come over with my truck and I don't get my stuff and then you catch me at the end of the project. Are there penalties as well as what they should have paid? I don't know the answer to they that. They would have to pay from the time that their vehicle arrived here as well as their business license. Okay. I don't know if there's a need to send something to somebody to tell them what they need to do up front or to remind people of what the requirements are because I think there's some... I don't know if more are falling through the cracks now, or I'm just noticing, I'm personally now noticing them. And um, so I just, or maybe reiterate to Vons to tell their people what the rules are to of all their subs. For example, Vons, it could be okay. the Zane Gray. I mean, I don't know, that, that's really kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, well, if, so. if you see commercial vehicles at a project site, you can always let me know. I know, but wouldn't it be but nice? I mean, but it, it would be nice. I guess. So it would if, be nice if they, everyone <laughs> always followed all the rules. I know, but if there was something <laughs> preemptive we could do, I guess, would be we nice. We do, when the general contractor comes in to pull the business license, we tell them, 
All your vehicles have to have, they have permits. Everything you bring into the island has to have permits on it, except for like bulldozers and oh, right, typical, right, right. <clears throat> excuse me, large construction vehicles. Right. Or equipment, not vehicles. But they pay something to bring them. You bring them over in the bar. No, yeah, once they they're have here, to pay we the barge to bring them over. Here. No, we don't. We don't charge those big vehicles that go up and down our streets. They don't get charged anything for heavy equipment. No, I don't. Yep. No, it's not if they don't require a permit. A permit on them? No, any. Well, because what they're doing to our roads is not good. So we may want to look put that on a. I don't know if you agree, but they they go down my street, and that's not the truck route. And so, um, and I'm sure they go down other streets that aren't the truck route as well. Probably. So. And I think we've had complaints about that. I, I think my recollection is the challenge is that the code guys have difficulty or are not allowed to do moving violations, and that's the sheriff's responsibility. And it's, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but it may not be enforced at the level yeah. that it should be. But if there's a big tractor on a site, it had to get there somehow. I agree. So, okay. so you don't so necessarily if have to. If their construction yard is filled of dreams, then it's very safe to assume that they are going back and forth. <laughs> exactly, exactly. From. But Sumner is part of the truck ride, right. I believe. Not because it needed to be in order to get right. up the canyon. Yeah. But not Clarissa or. Descanto or in some or of those others. Right. Yeah, right. okay. And what about working with the barge to yeah, leave an this. envelope or something on the vehicle or in the vehicle that states the rules or something as they're coming over? We, states the rules and all their requirements. Yeah. Well, we, we even discussed that they get the permit before they bring the vehicle over, but yep. then we, I think the discussion was also if the express does, I mean, if the freight service doesn't want to be in the enforcement business mm -hmm. to let us so that we know when they're coming over, it's already here. I mean, you know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if we can have that discussion with them again to get them involved a little bit might be nice. Well, you know, I think if we prepackaged, you know, 50 envelopes for the however many years that last prepackage them and there are city of avalon envelopes that are just and left then, in the vehicle then it's not an enforcement it's an education right oh and I well could, yes and that's something that we could ask the building official just to when he's on the job site just to glance at the vehicles and make sure they have stickers on them i mean i yeah i would have assumed he was already doing that um, and then i've noticed a lot there's some people that are doing stuff to their homes and there are not permits okay. and I it's it's the city's losing revenue number one and the right. reason that they're supposed to be inspected is to make sure they're safe Correct. so I mean this isn't a slam to you Amanda or to Steve it's just I and I notice we have what needs to happen up there but I don't know if we have to reiterate to send a letter out to every handyman general contractor and all those subs to remind them what what a permit what requires a permit because they seem to forget and there it's are amazing how that happens for that yeah it's a multiplier yeah. um there are fines for starting work without permits if you hear of people hammering and nailing and sawing after hours on the weekend i would like to know right. so that we can go out and find out what's happening yeah um there is a one of our prime enforcements is the you occasionally have the handyman guy who's doing more than $500 worth of work. We're, so that tips it over into something that should be a licensed contractor. So it is something we're constantly chasing. And you're right, they tend to forget. There's a, a, lot, a lot of, oh, I didn't think I needed a permit. Right, right. right. And <laughs> what I tell everyone is if you're not sure, call and ask. And we can tell you, no, you don't need a permit to put down new carpet. Yes, you need a permit to, you know, rebuild your right. house. So, yeah. Um, and I guess but, this is another way to let the people know today, as we're talking about this, those are who are have the ability to watch. Yeah, but if again, if you see it or hear it, right. let us know. And sometimes we go there, and there there's material there, and there's a lot of noise, but it's not work that it's cosmetic. It's not necessarily right. something that requires a permit. Right. So when a, when a participant in the community comes for a business license is a handyman, do we have anything that we give them? Um, or is it sort of their responsibility to work with the planning and building department? We were giving out the definition of what the state contractor's license says, a handyman's limitations 
are. Um, I have attached that to the business license routing. I don't know okay. if it's something that's just always handed out. Okay. Because I know occasionally we get a handyman that'll pop up new handyman in town mm -hmm. and then maybe somebody else will drop off and then next year another one pops up. Right. So, right. Okay. Thank okay. you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. So that's what the 4th of July show was supposed to look like. <laughs> um, thank you to Chief Krug um, for his help in this, um, JJ and his staff and the communication, uh, just a collaboration there. Uh, special thank you, and, and we haven't given credit enough credit to the chamber who actually paid for uh, this show and, um, and got this one free and the next one free. But, um, <laughs> That, that's what the show was supposed to be. That was the show that was July 4th. It wasn't anything above and beyond. It was supposed to be a really good show, and it was a good show, and that will be our expectation for, from here on out. So thank you all for the support and letting us do it over the weekend. Um, I think the, uh, the crowd down at Front Street was great. Um, the local music, uh, I heard from some of the locals, would like to see that every weekend. I'm not sure we're, we're quite there yet, but I think we're starting to entertain more of the kind of a little more of the local flavor with what the chamber is doing with uh, bringing in some, some acts in from over town. So it seems to be a nice blend. Um, a couple things coming up for our fall programs. Uh, we are kicking off. And then, JJ, we had 64 canoes last year, not 25 or 30. So hopefully you're expecting a few more than <laughs> the 25 or 30. So I think it's probably closer to that, that number. Um, Fall programs, we're kicking off this weekend with our tumbling dance and ninja program. Uh, this Saturday, we're taking sign-ups uh, throughout the week for that. Uh, we kick off also this Saturday with a Special Olympics uh, tennis program. Um, and thank you to the Island Company for letting us use their, their courts up there. Um, I've gone up with uh, Council Member Albers um, and, and the Women's Tennis Club is going to let us use, or what used to be the, the club, is going to let us use some of the rackets and balls and some of the supplies they have up there. So nice little collaboration there and see if we can get some tennis going back here on the island. Um, we are trying to get an adult flag football program off the ground uh, that starts um, in a week and a half. Um, and if I could read my writing on this one, um, I think that was it. Thank you. Yeah. Would you mind um, sending that company a letter on behalf of the city council and the p visitors and residents of Avalon, how wonderful that was? Something, could you send a letter on, or, or make a, or somebody write a letter on, put it on our letterhead for us to sign or me to sign or something? Sure, I think, yeah, uh, Chief and I got texts out right away saying great show, but we'll put something in, in form yeah, of writing was, a letterhead. Yeah, it was yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, the, uh, the main operator came out and ran the show for us, and. Um, he had a good crew on it, so it yeah. was uh, it was fun. Great, yeah. great. Thank you. Thank oh, you. So I'm sorry. Two yeah. quick things, Dan. I wanted to compliment you on the activity brochure. I think that it was done very nicely. Thank you. And the other thing I wanted to ask is, what's the timeline with the the uh, master plan? Um, so the plan was to come back the second meeting in September. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I keep pushing this thing down the, the road because they're they're not quite there with it. So it'll be the second meeting in September or the first meeting in October. October. We're within the next month here. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, thank you. Great. Madam Mayor and members of the City Council, finance also cannot take credit for the fireworks show. <laughs> But we were able to uh, get payroll out last week in spite of the computer crash. And I uh, wanted to report we're working on five audits and two major reports. Uh, the main audit, the one we've all been anxiously waiting for, it's the fiscal year 17 audit. Got some good news today. We uh, submitted the last of our responses to the auditor's questions. We're hoping to get audited numbers uh, by the end of the month or the first week of October. Great. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. I was going to ask if we could, um, in conjunction with that audit, do something for the City Council and the public on unfunded pension liability. And post employment benefits general. Okay. You're talking about the pension unfunded liability? Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of information on that. Yeah. I'll talk to the City Manager on that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, that's it for... 
everybody. Okay, we city meeting. manager report. I have, I have nothing, Okay. City attorney? I have nothing, although I'll see you next week at the league conference. Yes. Council member reports? Oh, that's next week. Who wants to start? <laughs> we'll stay with tradition and I'll go first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, one of the reasons that I asked for that um, report on unfunded pension liabilities, uh, you probably heard that the um, PERS program throughout the state, which provides retirement benefits to um, city and government employees generally throughout the state, it only has about 68% of the money it needs over time to pay everybody's pension. And I was, I was, um, a little taken aback because somebody reported to me that city employees thought that I was gunning for their pensions and it's just the opposite. I'm trying to make sure that when you get to be as old as I am that you can collect that pension and that the city's going to be able to pay it. And so part of my, um, you could call it a tirade or you could call it a passion, um, relates to making sure that even though we've discovered we have two and a half million dollars less than we thought we had, that we still are going to be able to meet our obligations to the city workers because I take that very seriously. And then the other thing that I wanted to um, just ask about is um, where we are with the permit parking since Vaughn seems to be rolling along. It might it that would be good to get that in place before they open as opposed to. I can't remember what date I had set for We that had a date set for that. We do. Oh, yes. okay. I'm sorry. Yes. Great. That yes. was on that email with a bunch of dates. Oh, with all those approved. dates. Yeah. Okay. Great. I will go back and look at that. Thank you. I only commented on the ones that were most recent. That's at the beginning of this meeting. Okay. Great. See memo. Okay. Oh. Really? Me? We're not. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a few couple things. Uh, Andy kind of touched on the one that I've got also got complaints on about the trucks and the vehicles and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of them are bonds and the subcontractors are coming out. And it seems that some of the subcontractors are buying carts and stuff and running around without permits and stuff on them that I saw. Okay. Um, one of the problems may, we might be able to uh, have resolve it a little bit is maybe have code go out in the mornings before they work, open up down there at bonds and just go and take a look at all the permits on the vehicles, if they have them. And if they don't, then they could send them up to City Hall to get their permits. I mean, it would seem like it would only take a few minutes before they get started. They don't start till 8. That might help resolve some of that, if we could do that. I know their plate's probably full a little bit, too, but That's right, that you. might be a little Still. way to resolve part of that, maybe. Uh, the other thing was I also got a lot of complaints on the uh, <clears throat> Three Palms area and the Hogsback area about trash overloading and cigarette butts and this and that and god forbid we know it's not the tourists doing that i mean uh, i hate to say i think it's a lot of the locals that are doing it because the tourists don't have vehicles to get up there for most of the point and i hate to say that because i was born and raised there but it doesn't mean they're not also doing it but i think it has a lot to do with responsibility of a lot of uh, local island kids okay. maybe doing that uh i don't know who we talked to about and i thought i'd heard somewhere along the line that the sci company had a security that drives along I've, the road I've at that, night i've heard that also but i don't know what their capabilities are to stop people or their friends or whoever may be up there i don't know we will contact them if you can contact mm -hmm. them or maybe if and if not maybe we could have the deputies start patrolling up there a little more mm -hmm. um but maybe go both ways back way back and forth maybe do that and get a lot of complaints about that okay and then my last thing is the tickets for the express they they expire why is there an expiration date on the tickets oh, the for them. the year? And I know we brought this up before we kicked this can down the road. It's already paid for with everything, right? From the state and us, right? Yes. Why is there an expiration date on them? Yeah. My we, understanding, Richard, is that's just my, that there is something uh, when they were granted with the CUP that that was all part of uh, that. And I could provide a copy of that I was given from the, the um, Express and verify that but it was all part of whatever was approved to, to go along with that and i think the other part of the conversation was is why couldn't we write them to do a revision to the tariffs because maybe they did if if when that went through if we didn't know or didn't comment at the time um and it's the same thing we have to talk about with our dial ride and art tickets because those those expire as well so Sam, maybe we could yeah do a little revise maybe on the yeah. tariffs Hey, that was all. Thank you. Um, 
We want to say congratulations to Avalon Lancers. I guess they kicked butt on last Friday, so that was good for their first game. Um, we had a law enforcement meeting. Um, city manager, myself, Captain Hawking, Orlando Chico, and uh, Dana Garcetti from um, Supervisor Han's office. It was very informative, um, and I, don't, I guess we could call it direction, was some direction was given, and uh, Captain Hawking was very supportive and, and very much into what we were saying about traffic safety on Saturdays and cruise ship days, if there's a way that they can, because they have two offers, they have two officers on, I believe, or even if they have one, to, to try to do some traffic control on those two busy intersections. Crescent and Metropole and Crescent and Clarissa. They don't need to stand there all day, but they would be able to observe a lot. Dogs, bikes, uh, people drinking, loud vehicles, all of that. And people are gonna listen to law enforcement much more than they're gonna listen to somebody like me telling them to do that. As a matter of fact, there's one person in the community made it, an elderly person, older than me, made a comment to somebody and they, they told her they were just very, very rude. And so that, that's very intimidating to somebody to try to do something good for the community and then to be scolded. Um, so we also talked about the reserve officers because we had gotten a lot of complaints about them kind of work, working in twos and talked to them about the need for them to kind of divide and conquer and that kind of thing. And yes, they do have ticket books. Um, we also talked about, which is kind of disappointing, and I don't know if we can still pursue it, but uh, Dana Garcetti, who does a lot of the public safety things for, for Supervisor Hahn, when we have officers that are, that are injured on the job, IODs and you're done duty, we don't get any replacements. So we're really under, you know, we're really undercovered, and it, as you see, you'll see Captain Hawking out there at all, you know, seven days a week practically. So it puts a lot of pressure on those staff that are here full time and that are doing their job. So um, I think we still may want to investigate that a little bit more. When I was talking to the county, they were saying from a fire perspective, if they have people that are out, they bring over firemen because you you can't not have them. Now maybe it's more of a because it's fire. You know, the potential for fire is worse than what could happen in the law enforcement realm, I don't know, but I think it's worth us kind of going forward a little bit more and looking into that. But it was a very productive meeting. And we also talked a little bit about community volunteers, and yes, they, they could do that. And I've been approached by one person in particular, and I think there's others that would be interested in maybe being that traffic guard, that little person that guides people. So hopefully the sheriff would want to proceed with some kind of a volunteer program. Maybe they have a little vest or something, and they could be those traffic people. So I don't know, Denise, if anything else came out of that that you want to mention? No. Nope. No, that's about it. Okay. And then I go to the SCAG meeting on Thursday in Los Angeles. Did I go past you? You should always go last. <laughs> I guess I was so excited. It's okay. It's okay. I was... She was so organized. I was like, I know. Oh, right? <laughs> okay. It's on my piece of paper. Sorry, baby. That's okay. So as Chief Krug mentioned, um, Mayor Marshall and myself and, and uh, Harbor Master, who was definitely a celebrity, um, and Captain Hawking, we went to the um, closing ceremonies of the Yacht Club and just wanted to say, Thank you so much to all the members. They really, really raise a lot of money for organizations in our community. They do a lot. There's many members that do live here full time that are very participative in our community. And um, I, I just want to say thank you for all you guys do for, for our small community. Um, fantastic fireworks show. It's been talked about enough tonight, but can't say enough about that. Um, then Mayor Marshall and myself were on a conference call with approximately 20 others in an update to conversations which started well over a year ago to bring additional mental health services and drug and alcohol services to the island for both youth and adults. We're getting closer to finalizing details for additional services, which is extremely exciting. The Child Guidance Center has also added two therapy days per week and have a psychiatrist committed to either visiting the island to treat or provide services via 
uh, telepsychiatry. Sorry. Um, also included was an update that seven staff members at Catalina Island Medical Center were trained in 5150 holds of patients and also the granting of a reciprocal agreement from Orange County to LA County for the doctors here to be able to write 5150 holds of patients who are being treated in our emergency room. Um, our emergency room, as you may know now, is connected to UC Irvine in Orange County, so that reciprocal is, is really valuable for us. Uh, we're also trying to find a date in September to bring everyone back together and look at the facilities on the island appropriate for a confidentiality and uh, for their services. So hopefully more to come next month. Uh, Councilmember Olson and myself had our monthly hospital consortium meeting. The topics um, each month so far, they've been very valuable conversations. The topics for this month were to talk a little further about housing requirements that a new hospital may, may need, uh, the water allocation, um, the actual project and scope development, and the uh, needs assessment were all <coughs> items of discussion. Nothing definitive to report other than these were discussionary items and we'll continue on in our next meeting uh, at the end of the month. And I'll be attending Gateway City's Council of Government uh, monthly meeting tomorrow night. And lastly, um, I want to report to my fellow council members that I did ask, um, I'm not sure how the whole process will happen, but I have asked uh, City Manager Ratty to, um, I drafted some talking points and asked that we send a letter to Catalina Broadband regarding the um, significance of the outages that we have had this summer. Um, we all as council received the notice that um, Edison was making some replacements and due to the replacements that caused, would have caused Catalina Broadband to have to shut down their services for those days. However, there was a remedy that could have been in place which was um, bringing in a generator to continue the services for members of our community. And in the summer months, you know, there were many shop owners that had to close on a busy summer day. Um, many, many retailers who could not run credit cards and it just causes such an impact in our community. Hoteliers can't check in or check out guests. They can't collect monies. And unfortunately, the nature of where we are in this day and age is that we are forced to do things online. We don't have the same types of services, um, you know, just given software packages and whatnot. So um, I, that impact is very real. And I spent a significant amount of time talking to members of our community who voiced their, their concerns about being shut down essentially for a day. Um, so I, I've asked for that. If there's any opposition for that, I would love to talk about it no, yeah, that's, that's all I have I'm sorry. okay uh, oral communications this is an opportunity opportunity for people from the audience to speak on items that are not on the agenda you will be li limited to three minutes and no action will be taken Good evening, Mayor, Council, Jim Luchahan, Catalina Island Chamber and Visitors Bureau. I just wanted to let you and, and members of the public know that September is officially California Wine Month. And um, we are fortunate that we are host on the island to both the um, Catalina Wine Mixer and our annual Women's uh, Wine Festival, Women's Forum Wine Festival. So those are two of the top events we'll be promoting through the state. Um, that's the, the appropriate subject for visitors to choose our island. And um, if any members of our business community who have not yet responded to our pleas for information about what they're doing for Wine Month um, are now reminded officially to, to please let us know so we can incorporate that into the promotions. Um, on the business side of our operations, we'll be bringing our auditors over to audit the fiscal year ended June 30 books. They'll be starting the, um, uh, the 15th or 16th, whichever is the Monday there of September and be here throughout that week. Uh, we have not historically had them attend a board meeting as part of their final reporting, but this time it's timely. It overlaps with the week of our board meeting, so the auditors will be at our meeting as well. Thank you. Great. Any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else? 
No. Okay, then we'll go to the... Cons oh, I'm sorry, John. Mayor, Council, John King, 360 Marilla, and also Aficionado Charters. Uh, just have a couple of thoughts to share uh, since I'm here. Um, first of all, I do feel the pinch. <laughs> and I do wonder if um, there's possibly a way to have those of us who are in business in the harbor and paying 7% already of all of the charter or whatever business we're generating um, can get some kind of special dispensation from the increases in fees that we're kind of being surrounded with. Uh, dinghies are now being pulled out at, what is it, $26? Is that to pull out a dinghy now? And uh, the increase in fees for year-round mooring and such. We do feel the pinch. Um, and those of us who are already paying the 7% to the city are kind of asking, well, gee, isn't there something that we could negotiate on that? Uh, second thought, um, Richard, uh, brought up the notion or the issue of the trash and the, the, the folks up on the out, outer roads uh, scares me to death. I read an article in the Times, and maybe you could kind of substantiate this, of the percentage of uh, wildfires that we've had that were started by cigarettes is mm -hmm. like 70% or something ridiculously high like that. It's hard to hear over there. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so that's just another thought. And then uh, lastly, um, we donated for the fireworks show, Aficionado Charter, so <laughs> we wanted to get a little of the joy, too. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, consent calendar. There are 12 items on the consent calendar this evening. The last one will be uh, the City Council acting as the Housing Authority. First one is proving the minutes for the OCT... Uh, August 21st, uh, regular city council meeting. We have warrants for a total disbursement of $628,634.90. We're asking you to adopt an ordinance amending section 10-2.214D of the municipal code pertaining to dinghy docks to add a height restriction for vessels secured to the city's transient dinghy docks. Number four is um, asking you to adopt the ordinance amending Title VI, Chapter 14 of the Avalon Mis Municipal Code, prohibiting the use of plastic straws, stirs, single-use carryout bags, additional uh, polystyrene products uh, under designated circumstances. Uh, number five is uh, adopting the ordinance repealing Title III, Chapter 5 of the Avalon Municipal Code relating to cable television systems and replace it with a new chapter five relating to the state video service franchises. And those ordinances were introduced and waived, all further readings waived at the last uh, city council meeting. Number six is adopting the resolution appro approving the annual application for TDA Article 8 funds for fiscal year 2019. Number seven is to authorize the city manager to execute an amendment extending the franchise agreement with Avalon Mooring and Diving Service for an additional five years from July 1st, 2018 through June 30th of 2023 and update the agreement to incorporate the city's current insurance requirement. And I did want it noted uh, that they had a letter ready to submit asking us to do this when we had our Pebbly Beach lift station incident and things kind of got lost. Uh, number eight is to authorize the expenditure of $25,000 to the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project for the BITE uh, 2018 Regional Monitoring per the requirement of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, a permit for the Avalon Wastewater Treatment Facility. Number nine is to approve the final parcel map, uh, 77137, created to split um, the property at 357 Whitley into two lots. Number 10 is the, um, to authorize the city manager to execute a one-year agreement um, for our TOT occupancy audit in which needs to be done. And we, uh, Mr. Torres, had reached out to Brownell and Duffel, who had done it forever. And anyway, he got some quotes. They ceased to exist, apparently. So 
Uh, we needed um, a new company anyway, because yeah. it's been a while. <laughs> Number 11 was to approve the construction plans and authorize a solicitation for a request for bids for the construction of the Cabrillo Mole Ferry Terminal Revitalization Project. And number 12 for the Housing Authority is to approve the construction plans and authorize a solicitation of a request for bids for the construction of the 206 East Whitley Avenue Sewer Lateral Replacement Project. Council, any items to be pulled? I had some questions on number 10 okay. and 11. Okay. And I'd like to pull number 9. Yes, yes thank yes. you. Do you want to ask your questions? Or do we want to... If it's just a question. I think we... There's more than one question. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So 9, 10, and 11? Yes. Mm -hmm. I will make a motion... I will make a motion to approve consent calendar items one through eight and 12. No, t um, did you want 10 and 11? Oh, I'm sorry. I did have a question about 12 too, I'm sorry. And that's a quick question. Uh, for Mr. Greenlaw, if I could so just quickly. Yeah. Thank you. 9, 10, 11, and 12. Right. On the Whitley um, sewer lateral. Uh, we have a motion? No, he's just gonna, oh. she just wants oh, to just a quick just question a quick on, one on okay. that. It, it looks yeah. like you've um, got a, uh, an attachment so that if, if and when we build additional units on there, this sewer line will serve the additional units? Yeah, we put a, a Y. So okay, that's, just, that's, uh, that's what I thought that was. So, I just wanted to Yeah, to so make right sure. now it'll serve as a clean out, but at some point, yep, you could hook another building in there. Okay, great. Okay, okay. then we can put 12 in the motion. Great, one okay. through eight and 12. Motion to right. approve. I'll second. Uh any comments, questions? Call for the vote. I don't know if I have it, but... Oh, no. oh I, I got it. I'm going to press display. Oh, we don't have this. I, know. I just realized we didn't have Dabby. Wait. All right, well. Okay, let's try it again. Okay. I'm assuming Pam is a yes. Something must have happened with her button anyway. Oh, so I it push. <laughs> four eyes. Okay, sorry. And one absent. pushed it far enough, sorry. <laughs> All eyes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Bray. Okay, item number nine. Uh, before we get started, I, I wanted to read oh. something in, into the record. It was um, to the esteemed mayor and council members. As Just for the record, though, oh. uh, the city oh, manager is recusing herself. She owns property within 500 feet. That's right. I'm sorry. And this is for Mr. King. As a neighbor, I am asking that the city council vote to deny the applicant's request for what is an illegal lot split and a precedent-setting degradation of Avalon zoning laws. Please allow me to share my reasons. This is, this is not a request to split a lot into two legal lots. This is a request to change a zone, to create an illegal lot, even by low density zoning standards, to burden neighbors with diminished pro property values, and to change the quality of life within our neighborhood for the economic benefit of a single owner. Further, this request to split the lot is illegal in that the owner has not presented or proven a hardship that might justify his request as per the city's very definition of a variance. Given this, it is reasonable to ask how the Planning Commission approved this request in the first place. Although we believe the Commission was acting in good faith, it is clear from the video of the meeting that they lost sight of the basic requirement for granting a variance as defined by the City Attorney and as was raised by Bob Kennedy during the discussion phase of the proceedings. The applicant simply failed to present or prove a hardship that was uniquely impacting his property. Whether he presented a complex array of options such as cluster housing, which left the commission voting for the lesser of three evils rather than considering the variance within the legal definition for approval. The proposed lot split would not just create two parcels with a structure on each as stated in your packet. It would create a de facto zone change that effectively takes the neighborhood from low density residential to a new undefined version of high density by allowing a new lot that is less than the minimum required lot size, less than the requ required minimum lot width, less than the required setbacks and less than the required off-street parking. Essentially, this lot, lot split creates a hardships on the adjacent property neighbors by stripping us of the zoning laws that protect and define the neighborhood. Furthermore, approval of this split essentially validates the substandard structure that currently exists on the lot nearest our home. The application includes a mitigation preventing development of the lots for a period of 10 years after the split is granted. 
Such a provision literally pre-approves the notion that a substandard lot with a substandard structure could at some future point be allowed to be developed. This is just wrong. The failure of the owner to present a hardship or reason for requesting such a radical change of zoning, a change which notably places a direct and indefensible hardship upon adjacent neighbors, should compel the city council to decline the request, thereby protecting the neighbors from a single owner's profit mining destruction of the zoning laws of Avalon and maintaining the integrity of one of the last low density residential neighborhoods in Avalon. Sincerely, John King. Um, Scott asked me to take this item because Denise had to recuse herself this evening. I'd like to start out by saying I take extreme exception to the idea that this was an Ill illegal lot sp split. We had a public hearing. We went through the process. We, everyone was there. We granted variances. We required a conditional use permit for the extra unit on the larger lot in order to legalize that unit. This lot is actually large enough to split into two legal size lots if you split it parallel <coughs> quickly, but because of the historic nature of the structure was on it, they requested to split it the other direction. And in order to accommodate the structures, the two lots did not meet the minimum lot size. So variances were granted. The findings were made at that public hearing in 2016. And for whatever reason, the neighbors chose not to pursue their administrative remedies through an appeal hearing. Tonight, you're here to approve the parcel map. It's been plan checked, it's been prepared. And at the last city council meeting, you asked that we confirm that the conditions of approval had been met. The moratorium document has been prepared and reviewed by Mr. Hewitt. And according to Mr. Campbell, it cannot be recorded until the parcel map is recorded. One has to follow the other. Mr. Hewitt, as you could see in your staff report, has submitted a parking plan to create parking on his own property, off street parking, because the planning commission at the hearing in 2016 denied his request for a variance to not have to provide off street parking for the remainder parcel. So he has provided a plan provide that off street parking on his own, on the remainder parcel, the larger parcel that did not have off street parking. Uh, Mr. Greenlaw has looked at it and as long as the driveway meets the standard plans requirements for a driveway apron, then he doesn't have any issues with them creating that parking in the area that they're talking about putting their driveway. So we feel like that they've met the conditions of approval like I said, it was a legally noticed public hearing in 2016, and so we're asking for you to approve the final parcel map so that it can be properly recorded. And what I would just add is that um, the sole uh, issue before the council is the finalization of the parcel map. Um, the other uh, issues uh, dealing with the variance were issues that could have been uh, appealed two years ago. They were not, so the time for um, for filing that appeal and pursuing uh, those arguments are have, have expired. Um, we've looked at the uh, parcel maps that and they were uh, what was asked for. And so what we're asking is the council to fulfill its statutory duties by saying the parcel map satisfies uh, what was granted at the planning commission meeting and to allow uh, Mr. Hewitt to uh, file those parcel maps. So I had a, just a question about the driveway. So, so if, the, if this is approved, nothing will be built for 10 years? Is that the first thing? The moratorium is on the smaller lot. Yes, and that's okay, Nothing the will be built for 10 years. Um, but, there, but the driveway is going to be put on his property. Correct, right, because that was the parcel that did not receive the parking variance. The smaller parcel has parking. Oh, the small. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so he, uh, he's a, oh, okay. And that's something that is done administratively. That's not okay. something that would require. Oh, no, a no I was confused. I thought well, he was going to be nice enough to allow that other place to have a parking structure on his property, which wouldn't make any sense. 
so thank you for no he, that. no the parking's being created created on the larger parcel that does not currently have off street parking right and th this i don't know we had that great meeting the other day with the planning commission and and when we're looking at trying to create housing some of those that you know whether it be the accessory dwelling unit or some of those and those are smaller units and on smaller lot sizes and those kinds of things so that fits kind of direction of where i know where we we appeared to be wanting to go when we had that joint meeting am i correct a little bit i believe so yeah okay I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. okay all righty well we have any other questions before sure. mr king comes up So I, I do want to say that I didn't say that the process was not legal. I think the process was fully legal. So I'm sorry for offending you on that. That was not my intent. I do feel like the outcome of the Planning Commission was uh, skewed by complexity and confusion and a lot of stuff. And I've talked with quite a few of the people who are in the meeting, but also people who are on the commission. But I do want to address why we didn't appeal. Um, we've had a couple of conversations, not many, I can guarantee you, with the neighbors. And we had come up with a mitigation which basically said, look, it's going to impact our property value negatively. If you could just trim those trees, those palm trees, we would at least feel like, well, there's a, a give and a take. There's a mitigation. We were told specifically that you will get what you want by the neighbor. We were also told on a second conversation after the um, approval that the tree trimming is on a schedule, which again we read in, you're going to get what you want. So we kind of took the handshake deal and we kind of did what we thought was a neighborly thing and said, okay, then we're going to just back out of this. So the 15 day or what is the time period to appeal? 15 day, which by the way, I think that's kind of a short amount of time. Uh, the 15 day uh, appeal period passed and we were fine with that. And now two years later uh, we're wondering where that view is and we were basically told by the neighbor when we questioned that that uh, they now like the trees the way they are which basically is to, told us to kind of go away. So that was why we didn't um, appeal then and also, I think we we're a little naive, uh, not really as up on the process of how it, you know, what the steps are, what have you. And we're dealing with a person who is a member of the Planning Commission, who knows the in and outs and knows the timing and knows the people on the board. So we felt like we were a little bit outgunned anyway. So, you know, to go and try to appeal a decision to the commission that had just made the decision to approve it with one of their members. Uh, being the um, person who is requesting it felt like it was a one-handed fight so we came here so this is kind of our our last stand and what we were really asking we, we you know we're not trying to get in the way of this whole thing uh, we just felt like there was a way to mitigate it and so that we could leave with the feeling like okay well you know it's terrible to have this teeny lot next door anyway terrible to think that they're going to develop on it at one point by the way, I also thought the moratorium was on both properties, but I'll go back and review the tape. Um, so I guess the end result is I'm kind of throwing myself at the mercy of the court and saying, you know, imagine yourself uh, living in a house that you built and enjoying the process and then all of a sudden kind of being faced with, oh, the neighborhood's going to change, the zoning's going to change, there's no mitigation whatsoever. It just feels like uh, we lost a fight there. So we're just hoping that we could get it sent back to the Planning Commission and rediscuss some of the issues. Because I do believe if we did discuss the issues, I mean, obviously I've laid my cards out on the table that we believe there's a mitigation that could leave everybody happy, which is much better than hiring lawyers where everybody's sad and only the lawyers are the people who kind of benefit from that process, which looks like that would be our last resort if, you know, it gets approved tonight. So that's, that's kind of where we are. Okay. Thank you. Did you have a question? 
I don't right now. I don't know if anybody else does. Comments by anyone? Oh, please. Um, I'm not going to address uh, those comments, but two issues came up in the approval um, in your recommendation on the document that's going to get recorded that puts the 10-year moratorium. One is that the starting date for the 10 years, um, the way I read the approval of the Planning Commission, it starts when the project was approved and the document says when it's recorded. Um, my thought was it should be when it's approved because when it finally gets recorded due to a whole variety of things that are out of my control, it just keeps getting pushed back further and further so it's not a 10-year no build, it's a 12 or 13-year old no build. The second... Wait, uh, I, but really now are you saying it's really only eight years? Mm-hmm. From approval, it's 10 years. When we got approved two years ago. Yeah, so now there's an eight years, first. only eight so years left eight on years the moratorium. That's what he's requesting. I'm requesting that it gets interpreted as the approval said, the way oh. I read it, 10 years from the date of the approval. The second issue is um, I'm assuming that if I'm able to buy that little piece back and combine the two lots into one, that the conditions, the moratorium or whatever other conditions, would disappear. Um, but I wanted to make that clear, and those are the two. Um, I, 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 you lost me on that second one. Well, we split the property, and I know it sounds strange, but there is, there is some desire to reunite them or after they're split. But it wouldn't happen for, let's say, a couple of years. And if we do make it back into one lot, what I wouldn't want is a moratorium on a piece of the lot that really wouldn't exist anymore. And your, your counsel can probably articulate that a little bit better. But anyway, those were the two issues that are, I believe, before you. Well, now you're making me think that we should, you should figure out what you want. I mean, did that just well, confuse no, me? It, <laughs> I'm sorry. The reason is, if it's, we're dividing it into two, but at some point in the future, I may want to buy that lot. But you own it. Kind of. I mean, it's, it's, it has a purchaser already, and they're pleased with it, and we're going to go through with it, but in a couple of years, if I want to buy it back from that person. I basically have an option to buy it back. Mayor, I have a question. Is that please? Uh, um, I know it sounds. Oh, are you still? You're still no, confused on that one. Okay. Um, what if you have already thought about the option of condoing? Can you just give me some history I've never on that? Of the option of condoing. And how come? I'm, I'm just curious. Because um, then you don't split the lot. No. The reason. It's funny we. Well, um, never mind. I'm not going to even go into it. Um, we've never just considered um, doing a condo. The one thing we did consider, and I backed off, ironically, because I thought it would be too confusing, is doing a cluster subdivision, which is permitted in the city of Avalon, and we could have done the same thing, and that would wipe out the variance path and end it in the same result. But we decided not to go that route, to go for the variance, because the lot area is clearly big enough to be divided into two lots and it seemed like based on all the neighboring lots which are undersized the variance was the more clean way to do it and the other unit that's on the the, the little house that's on the side that's just part of the big house that's all part of that no, that's it's, that's that the one the that's house. the one and and you would build so you have the main house is on the larger lot, right. the little house little is on house. the smaller lot, and there are no plans to build anything on either. Oh, you're just wanting to subdivide those right. two. Right, we're just I'm removing the little coming. house from, from the, big, the house. big house. And the, could that house at some point be built up legally? Um, yeah, after t the little house? Yes, after, after 10, 10 years. After 10 years, or eight years. It could. there is a pretty good setback on both sides. So with, probably will always stay a relatively small house. Uh -huh. okay. He'd on have to come back if there was anything done after the moratorium on the little house. 
that go through the planning process. It just goes through the regular the process. Again. process. Okay. okay. John, did you want to make another comment? Sure. I think Eric just made my argument for me. This is a complicated project. And right now you guys are kind of being tasked with the notion of deciding on making the approval. Is it eight year now? Is it 10 year? Does it happen when the parcel map was made? Does it happen after you approve it? Um, there's other issues with this thing in terms of setbacks. Uh, Eric likes to use the notion that cluster housing can be developed with no variance. That doesn't mean that there wouldn't be challenges from the neighbors. The small little house that's on there is right on the property line. All of those houses in that neighborhood are supposed to be 10 foot setback. When I built my house, I had 10 foot setbacks on both and setbacks in the front and back. So we have a 20 foot wide house instead of a house that would be much easier to build. So we lived within the, the variances or, or within the code because we respected the notion that this was that kind of neighborhood. And his request to change it just changes that. And it doesn't add any housing. It doesn't really, right, which by the way, I'm with you on that. We need housing in a bad way. But it's a very complicated project. And I think it needs to go back for more discussion in the planning commission. I think I can bring planning commissioners up here who I've already talked with who would be willing to share their opinions with you as well because they were confused by it. Well, that's interesting that none of them showed up this evening. What's that? But none of them showed up. I did not. Evening. We didn't know this was going to happen until this thing was, we thought it was going to be the 18th. Uh, remember when it was continued from the last time? Yeah. I heard about this this morning or yesterday afternoon that it's going to be on the agenda. Oh. So didn't really have a lot of time to muster much up yeah. in any event. Okay. Um, complicated project. Yes. I just wanted to share. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I just wanted to share one more thing with you. When we were reviewing the variances for the lot width and the lot sizes, one of the things we looked at was around all the other surrounding properties that are in the low density zone. Mr. Hewitt's property is just adjacent to the Whitley Arms. The Whitley Arms is the upper end of the high density residential. The properties immediately behind Mr. Hewitt's property all along Whitley. If you look at all those parcel maps, none of them have the 50 foot width, none of them have the 4,400 square foot minimum. You look at the lots across from the Hewitt property, they have the 50 foot lot width, they don't have the 4,400 minimum lot size. So uh, when we looked at all the surrounding lot size and properties, the Planning Commission didn't see it as a grant of special privilege or anything else to allow this property to have similar lot size and similar lot width to what currently existed even though the development standards require minimum lot size of 4400 minimum lot width of 50 feet that's not it doesn't exist in any great number in that area and it's all those are all low density properties i believe mr king's property when that lot was split by mr britfitch they do have the minimum lot size just barely for both of those lots and of course, one of them's um, shaped a little odd, so it's hard to get the 50 foot width. But those two lots did meet the minimum lot size. Okay. Thank you. With respect to the 10 year condition, it's staff's view that um, the date of approval is the date of the final approval for the map that's going to be recorded, which would be tonight. So it'd be 10 years. Um, and with respect to the uh, request to uh, add or amend the, more, the uh, thing that um, if he recombines them the moratorium goes away uh, one you can do that or you can just say you know, we're going to keep it as is and if he wants to go through a process of come of uncoupling them later and making them one then at that hearing uh, we could take off the moratorium you can you can do it now or if he decides in the future he wants to come back and you got to go through the process at that time you can decide what to do with the moratorium Comments, Council? Um, with regard to when the moratorium starts, I think that this case is a little different, as you pointed out, because 
um, Mr. Ewart had some conditions that he was required to do, and we had no control over when those conditions were going to be satisfied. So I think it was the Planning Commission's intent that the time would not start until he actually satisfied those conditions, which would be tonight. Obviously not the, you know, the recording and all that kind of stuff he can't control, but that he could have. And then um, I, I um, was intrigued by this and, and looked at some other cities. Some other cities don't allow variances on lot splits, but we clearly do. Um, so I think that given the fact that the city had approved the placement of the second house, created the hardship in some ways for the division of those lots in, in later years. So I don't have any problem finding um, that there was a, a hardship met in that respect. And I think it would be easier just to add a sentence to the recorded document that says in the event of a merger, the, the document's null and void instead of trying to track right. that document down later on. That's easy enough to do. Yeah. Is that a motion? Uh, that is a motion. I'll second it. Motion to second? Well, I just, I guess, um, are we back up here now? Yes. Okay, because I, I don't want to be muddied by any more participation. Um, where I really struggle is I painfully watched those planning commission meetings and there was mass confusion. There was a lot of terms being thrown out, things happening, and I, I, I guess I'm not allowed to have a personal opinion about what actually happened and how things were, how the approval came to be and how the particular items came to be. So. If, if I'm going to do my duty correctly up here tonight, I, I, I guess I don't agree with the Planning Commission's decision on all fronts. So I, I do want to make that known. I do, you just gave me a piece of information, Councilmember Albers, that makes a difference that the city uh, agreed that the second house could be placed there, which initially created the hardship, and I think that's valuable information to have. But I, I, I'm not comfortable with this, but I, I guess if all we're saying is that someone else has already made the decision, then why is it even coming to council? No, you have to, under the Subdivision Map Act, you have, the council has to be the one that approves the actual filing of that, of that map. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, all you're doing is you're saying, this is the map, the, the, the Planning Commission agrees to split it, they then go to the engineers, the engineer draws the map, and it comes to the council for final approval. That's what is on the agenda. So none of the other previous issues, the, the couple hours of these painful meetings, all of that doesn't make any difference for what the decision is we make tonight. Essentially, right. the decisions for everything else about the, the, the variance. And my issue isn't necessarily with the lot split, it's with all the variances. And, so, the, the, and there was an appeal period for that, and an appeal was not taken. That was two years ago. And so, so if it had been appealed, it would have been those discretionary issues would have come to us. Absolutely. It would have come to the council, just like the Vaughn's uh, deal did right. two years ago. Mm -hmm. The council acts as the appellate body. No appeal was filed. So the time to bring that appeal has expired. There's been a motion and a second. Call for the vote. It's only for the lots. Right. I have to. All eyes. I'm sorry, I have to. Hey, I got it working. All right, thank you. Number 11? Please? Sure. We okay. already did the TOT thing right now. Correct? No, wait, so, did we do Did we do on 10? We didn't do 10. The TOT out of service? No, uh, we're on 10. Yeah, yeah we're, we're on 10. On 10. Okay. That's the well, TOT. Right, right. Do you want to wait for it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, it's been a couple of years since the city has conducted an audit of uh, hotel transient occupancy taxes. Uh, the last time we did it was actually in 2016, but it was for the years 2014 and 15. So it's been about three years now. Uh, conducted an informal uh, uh, request for proposals, contacted four firms, tried to contact four firms. 
uh, got responses from all but Brownell and Duffy. That was the firm that conducted the audit back in 2016. Right. And uh, contacted the numbers we had on file for them, got on the internet, all the numbers were disconnected. Uh, I will report that prior to the meeting starting at five o'clock, I found a document in our file with a, another number and I called and I got a recorded message, so apparently they still exist. But anyway, they weren't part of this. The uh, only responsive uh, proposal was by Avenue Insights, and they were formerly known as Muni Services. They've been around since 1978, originally started as MRC, Municipal Resource Consultants. They, they're all over California. I used them in several cities. They're all over California. They do, they do good work. So they have a proposal they submitted to us uh, to uh, conduct an audit of 28 hotels at a cost of $24,500. They're proposing a two-phase approach. They'll review, they'll do random sampling of all 28 hotels. And uh, assuming that there's some additional findings from that, uh, generally spending their experience, that'll lead to more, a, me, a more detailed audit of about, of about 30% of those hotels. And uh, first phase is 14,000, second phase is 8,000. They're uh, requesting out-of-pocket expenses not to exceed $2,500. That brings them in at $24,500. The way the audit, the way that I will conduct the audit is I'll send letters out to all the hotels, let them know that we're gonna conduct an audit, that uh, if the council approves the contract with Avenue, Avenue is representing the cities, I will accompany the auditors on the first meeting with all the hotels and then We'll kind of take it from there. And uh, probably I would say the audit would be completed in about two or three months. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So there was, we contracted with somebody. Host compliance. Oh, host compliance. To do yeah. something and they said, yeah, and we'll probably, we're gonna find out so much and we're gonna get so much back and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know if we ever, Based on what we paid and what we got, what did we get? Was there any records of that? Well, I don't have a complete record. I'm trying to find complete records, but Brownell and Duffy, again, was the firm the city contracted with right. in 2016. It was August of 2016. They reviewed 2014 and 15. There were some findings. Uh, they charged the city $28,000. However, their audit also included harbor use fees, admission taxes, and percentage rents. So, I, so again, I only, I've only been able to find a little bit of information. I'm, I'm still searching. I can tell we you. We don't that. have the report, basically. No. But they well, did have Brown, findings. Brownell and, Duff, Brownell, Brownell and Duffy had been doing audits for the city for way too long, but for a right. long time. I think that Chuck Prince brought them in in the yeah. mid '90s or something. So yeah. they. They, you know, while. obviously something something fell apart, or I think that w one of them had illness in the family, or, or whatever. So, the, the reason I had asked to pull this was to number one, thank you for noticing that we're not getting Welcome. current yeah. audits, um, but to make sure that we have a plan for how these other audits are going to be covered. And I just happened to pull up Costa Mesa was one of the cities that most recently did a request for a proposal. They had about seven responses, mm -hmm. so I think it would be reasonable to make a decision do we want somebody to do all these other um on a spot basis the way we did it before sure. you know, it was kind of the luck of the draw um but also my concern is that we're just doing hotels on this um contract and clearly we want to incorporate um the i would think the, the bigger uh, you know like civr um you know the other properties because they are collecting tot on our behalf correct so you want to yes. be sure that they're processes and, and paperwork is in order also. Um, also. And I, I think that it, from my standpoint, I'd like to know who's gonna be responsible, who is the person that is overseeing this contract, who's making the contact with Muni and will be getting the reports and that we calendar nine months from now to make sure if we're not happy with this contract that we are geared up to go out um, to market and see if we can find somebody else. Yeah. But okay. Well, I'll be responsible for the contract. I'm going to be the project yeah, manager this is a on year, this. Yeah, because and I think that's appropriate. Let's you know, yeah. see. One, th well, one thing I did want to respond to your comments there is that uh, Avenue actually proposed to do these other audits, but I only solicited 
for the hotel TOT. I told them I'm talking about the, uh, the admission taxes and all the other ones later. So right now I want to focus. I'm recommending that we focus right. on the but, hotel but I don't, audits. I, since it's been so long since any of these audits have been mm -hmm. done, I think it's something that we want you know the city manager to move forward and, and see if we can put out a proposal, see what we can. Get well, I just want to make sure if, if we've not if we've not if we've not gotten our money's worth in the past. Um, I mean, if they're finding that if they found that everybody's been in compliance, yeah. most of the hoteliers have been the same. And if we didn't at least get our money's worth back on it, I don't know why we're even doing it at all. Well, they're, they're, hang on. They're, the, 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 the host compliance was not an audit of um, these are people that are actually reporting and sending in information. And we're looking at them to see are they really reporting all their revenues or not? Or are they kind of cheating or not? The host compliance was a search of websites to see no, if people. No, I'm not talking about that. VIBRs okay. and no, okay, no. It was a few since I've been here. We had a company that would go and look at that, and I'm and we paid them twenty eight thousand dollars probably, and it's like. But did we get 20? Was there really a problem, I guess, is my concern, if there's not a problem? Well, it kind of appears like they had findings. They generated revenue for the city. And I can, you know, as soon as I finish my research, I can get back to you all. Yeah. I mean, if we only made $12,000 and, and if, it was, if, you know, if we only got back $12,000. Well, from, I'm just going to say, any. I think part of the problem was they had been here so long that they had forged relationships with people, so it wasn't. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, no, I. Uh, a clean thing like I don't know you, you don't know me. My job mm -hmm. is to audit Start you, right. take your books out, and let's go yeah, through it. Right. This it had gotten to. Let's go have lunch. Right. I, I, yeah, I think truly yeah. that that's okay. that's what we. And Mayor see. Marshall, I know yeah. in the past that uh, there were some findings, and some were uh, very large quantities. Yes, and then that brought uh, there's a separate little audit committee, which I don't think we. Uh, um, set established that at the last election mm -hmm. that for appeals of any of us so say if you had a business mayor and we said well you, we think that you right. you owe us seventy five thousand dollars you could appeal right. to uh, this audit committee which would be two of the council and I think the finance uh, director okay. and and then each side does their supporting documents and then there's a, an understanding of really what's transpired so right. yes, but I, mean, really, I think it's the, worth the it. auditors should mm -hmm. pick up things like what you said about not having numbered invoices yeah. and, oh, no, and they you know processes yeah. to make sure that the city is collecting the tax that it's entitled. To. Right. And right. one thing about having an audit is that the hotels, if they know that we're going to be auditing them, we may not find anything. But if they know that they we're not ever going to be audited. They may be more inclined. Well, I get to it. I get it. I just cheat. don't. You know, you, I know you're always. Well, no, why no. Do we I mean, you know, it's and you right, and that's why question. I'm saying that for these other audits, I want to do a request for proposals and compare some prices and see right. Right. What, right. what's available. And but, but, by and large, what this proposal looked pretty much what Costa Mesa had in terms of yeah. the number of um, hotels that they were being audited in how, and what the mm -hmm. proposal was. It's, it's not out of bounds yeah. by any means. Well, the good news is, is that the reason we are doing a request for proposal is because we said at the, at the agreement of the last contract with Brown, Allen, Duffy that we would agree the extent, to the extension, but that it would go out to RFP mm -hmm. when right. that ended. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. also yeah. during that last, I believe their last audit that they did was in 2016. I don't think we did 2017 audits. Well, they did the audit in 2016, but yes. it was of 2014 yeah. and 15. Right. So, so, so there has been no audit of 16, 17, or 18. Right. Yeah. So then um, during that process, that, that brought to my attention several holes that we have in the ordinance, of which I had sent requests to the finance director at the time that I'd like to discuss these holes in the ordinance. And mm -hmm. so we haven't done that. And I, I realize that's not on your shoulders, but I do have a list of holes that are in our ordinance that I really think we need to bring forward and, and discuss. Can you resend those out? I can resend those. You betcha. Great. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Is there a motion? I'll move staff uh, recommendation. Second. I'll second. Okay. Call for the vote. Four eyes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Number 11? Yes, sir. <laughs> now we're there. Yep, we're here. Okay. 
So this is the construction plans and uh, solicitation to request bids for the phase one um, Cabrillo Mole project. And I just had a couple of questions um, for you, Mr. Greenlaw, and, and also for our city attorney. So I take it that the bid documents themselves will reference the mitigation monitoring plan and place the responsibility on the contractor to comply with those? Yes. Thanks. Okay. And then the, the primary question I had is there's a, a really diff the difference here is between cracks and spalling and the repair methods. And I just want to make sure that I understand because something less than a quarter of an inch is going to require crack repair, which is essentially an epoxy injection. Correct. Right? And then if it's spalling, there's putting in new reinforcement and then. Yeah, you're cutting, cutting away the bad stuff. Right. Yeah, and then you're putting in putting new rebar if needed and. Right. Um, so. Okay, and forming a. Yeah. Are the lists at the back here of those areas where the engineer has made a determination, where um, Michael Baker made a determination that it's bigger than a quarter of an inch? Yeah, they just, you know, they, they went out there and surveyed it themselves, and that's what they came okay, up with. Okay, and that's what this list is, just because I'm, I'm flashing forward. You know, a quarter of an inch, the contractor says, no, it's not a quarter of an inch, and that's why I epoxied it. But, of course, that's because it was cheaper and easier to do it that way versus the more extensive fix. So I just want to make sure that we are anticipating and have dealt with that kind of a dispute with the contractor. Yes, and we'll, and we'll even uh, clarify it in the specs. So this is just a listing to give you, a, you know, approximate um, quantities and then how we get to measuring it. So if I'm out there looking at with my... Uh, ruler or tape right. within a quarter inch and I go another foot and it's now three-eighths of an inch you know how are we gonna make that decision yeah that was so the, that'll, the that'll thing. be discussed and that's common because uh, also you could yeah I could go on other methods but yeah that's that's the way that we'd clarify right that. but you know how and this goes but they yeah. think they say oh I thought it meant one thing and you say it thought it meant one thing and then you're in change orders and it's it's not yeah hopefully we describe the process so that if anybody was out there in the field they could right. work their way through it. and you're doing a mandatory um, bid job walk. walk yes absolutely okay, great and then the other question I had is so the deck surface is gonna it, I, I see that there's concrete patch is yes. there something that's going to go over that in phase no. two or what? No. Okay. It's five hundred thousand dollars more, and that so that's we checked into that to put a brand new okay. surface, and so we just felt hey we don't have the money, but that could be done in the future. No, no, no. Yeah. I just I, I yeah. just want to know what it's going to look like when it's done said there, and done. So if people are going to say why did we spend all this money and it looks like this, that we can explain. The most important thing was to protect the underpilings. It won't look like the patching that's being done right now. That's a temporary patch. It'll okay. be nice, clean cut lines, and then there'll be new concrete and high quality work, you know, versus, you know, we're doing high quality work for patching, but that's just something to get it done so that somebody didn't have a trip and fall, okay? Right. And that's the intent of what we're trying to do. And when you see the city crews trying to patch out there, so, okay. and, and that's good work also, but this will be, you know, something that's supposed to last. For a 20-year useful life right but but clearly we don't have the money where we're resurfacing we actually okay. went through that analysis and then we asked how much is it and they said five hundred thousand right. dollars was the estimate so well okay. we don't have that money now but it, that opportunity we're on top of the surface the most critical item is underneath under the water getting all the beams and getting the grates and getting all those and all the safety problems some of the other, uh, especially the cosmetic problems, you know, we can take care of that in the future if we need to. Okay. Uh, and then the um, the shade cover is is it's not separate is because a separate well, I want to get the bids on this. That? I want to get the bids on this and see w what level. Remember that was intended also to be a temporary shade right. because we didn't want to constrain the design of the total you know the the scope of the total project of with an architect and what you know all of a sudden we put on this shade structure that looks like something that doesn't <laughs> you know fit in with what phase two will bring right right okay. i was more concerned that if if we have the grant funds and we're spending them and we already know that they are temporary that um we've had some discussion and agreement as to where they eventually will go and that they're going to be appropriate 
somehow. for that if we're spending the money. So but that's that's coming. That's later. coming, and that's why I wanted to develop that so you had that chance to okay to ask all those questions, and then we could have a thoughtful discussion. All right, and then the last question I had was regarding the railings. It looks like it's a repair. So same existing. thing. Uh, I anticipate as we get to phase two that we'll do a ro ro a robust design, maybe some new railings. Okay, something that has some architectural features to it. And so this is making sure that structurally the concrete and the railings that are there are stable, and then we may end up replacing all of them, okay? okay. It's, the existing railings are stay there, but then uh, the architect may come up with something else. Okay, that was all the questions I had about that. Great, great. Is if no further comments or questions? Is there a motion? I'll move staff. Okay, second. I second. Okay, call for the vote. Four eyes. Okay. Ooh, general business. Okay. Item number Are thirteen. You ready for that me? would be you. Yes. Okay, yes. great. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, before I get to my little PowerPoint, I just wanted to, um, I know it's in the staff report, but for the public, um, how this came about was that we held these really focused meetings with specific stakeholders for the Five Corners project as part of a secondary grant we were writing for that project. And we were showing them the plans that, that you all had seen and asking them what they thought about it. And um, everybody that came, actually had uh, comments about mapping and wayfinding and all these other things that we all see happening in that intersection. It's, it's painful. I, I mean, I live across the street, so I probably walk across that intersection five or six times a day. And there's always someone in a golf cart with a map trying to figure it out. <laughs> so as a, as a result of that and the need for the city to have a um, a better map for the transit program, and that being a complicated issue, and looking at the maps that are available and that are being used, we realize that the maps really aren't that good. And so, um, this is what we came up with. Um, Jordan, how do I turn it on? Oh, there we go, okay, so. What? He said it was just gonna be easy peasy. Jordan, you lied. <laughs> Okay, hold on a second. Matt's coming. Sorry. Bob's coming. Yeah. Why it's is on this locked? side. She's in it. Oh, thanks, Matt. Next. Oh, Matt's helping me out. Oh, there we go. Ta-da. Okay. Oh, no, go back. Oh. Why is it? You go for it, baby. Going anywhere. You go, I don't know. <laughs> All my good stuff, you showed them. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. okay, you can sit down, down. Right. <laughs> Call for the vote. I'm done. Just say yes. Yeah, everyone would speed reading. I'm just a lot. Dudley, can you take a help? Dudley's. Sorry. Oh, wait. Hold on. <coughs> Click the it's little open. button it's for open. the Sorry. power. Click the, yeah, do you know the slideshow show. little button? From yeah, I'm pushing it and it's not from the beginning. Here we go. Okay, okay. now let's see. I may have to like <coughs> bend down here to push it. Um, oh, just go to next. Here you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. So the purpose of the Global Map Wayfinding Ad Hoc Committee is uh, to uh, develop a map that has continuity for visitors. So we envision this um, being the same map for the whole community. Bike rentals, uh, it's, it's the map that you're gonna see when you get on the Catalina Express, the pocket maps. Um, Jim was really helpful when we first started our map for the, um, the transit program, and he was able to give us his map, which you'll see. It's, it's, it's confusing. 
um, consistent naming of landmarks, streets, and parks. Every map has a different name, and so we would like that to be remedied. And then accurate maps that, that are with a, a cartographer is what we're going to really need. And um, so there's that. Um, these are some samples of some, uh, just a few of the many existing maps in the city of Avalon. This is the chamber map. And this is the map that the city decided that we were going to use to try and indicate our bus stops on our transit system, which was very confusing for the, for the uh, riders. Um, this is an example of island rental golf carts, uh, their map. And they do have color coding. Um, I do believe that the uh, other rental uh, golf cart company uses the same colors. So there's a little bit of continuity there, but there's, it's still a difficult map to try and navigate. Um, this is the other company, and so you can see it's complicated. And the other thing, too, is you have to think about people looking at these maps while they're driving. I mean, the, the writing is so small, they're not familiar with it. it it's, it's, it's a problem. Um, this is the Conservancy's map. Um, this is the Island Company's map. Um, this is this one we pulled out because we call it Casino Dive Park. They call it Casino Point. There's not any continuity there. So those are just a few samples of the many, many maps that are out there. So this is kind of the idea of the committee. Um, the group will meet over the course of uh, two or three months. Um, the city and chamber, Jim's offered to be uh, my partner in this. Um, we'll get quotes from a cartographer, a graphic designer, and then I will bring back proposals to the city council with the total cost and a breakdown of each member's cost for approval. So we're anticipating that all of us would equally pitch in for the cartographer and um, any graphic designs that we would need, and then if we decided on overlays, which is, I think, where we're going with it, so for the rental car company, there would be overlays for where it's safe to drive or where they're allowed to drive. Um, for the bicycles, it would be similar. For the transit, it would be something different. So th these are all kind of things that we'd like to flesh out during our, our group meeting. Um, and then I also showed you the people at the, that the writing and staff report went to. Already eight, eight people are interested in and participating. I'm sure there'll be more. Um, the city staff will bring the final product uh, to the city council for review, and then each member will be responsible for their own overlays, whatever those might be. Um, one of the things we really want to focus on in the maps is getting this five corners intersection accurately depicted because it looks a little wonky. Um, and then, um, devise a theme for wayfinding, determine areas that the, within the city that need wayfinding, um, discuss costs and benefits, and then we'll come back, I'll come back and provide a report regarding the recommendations of the committee regarding wayfinding. Um, and then follow up after city council input. And that's pretty much it. It's, explain to me what, what, how an overlay works. Well, so basically you have a base map, and mm -hmm. then for your needs, um, and, and I'm hoping, my vision is that the whole group will come to a consensus on, on you know, the rental, cart golf company, rental golf cart companies obviously already seem to be kind of aligned with their color coding, which is great, um, but I think it could even, it could even be better. It could, and, and I think the thing of it is, is that I don't know if the way the map is laid out right now makes sense when you come in off the boat. You know, there's not a north, a south, an east, a west. There's there's a lot of things that are missing on a map that people look for when when they're using a map. But explain to me the overlay, how that works. So so um, we have the base map, and then for the city's purposes, I'm going to use um, us as an example. We would overlay our bus stops onto the map. And we print them out, and now we have a map. And now we have our map, but it looks the, the same as every other map in the so, city. So every, except for those, so every, all of these people and whoever else join in will have, now we got at least 10 maps here. Right, well, it's one map. It's one base map. But if I put my overlay on. It's just color, it's just colors and information, but the actual map, the actual street names and all those other things are, it's, it's consistent across and it's, and it's accurate. Right now it's not accurate. It's kind of like a cart, it's cartoony. So everything I mean, would be overlaid onto one map. 
Um, no. no, 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 no. Each, so now you've got different, I mean, right. it looks but, the same as you've got different maps. Annie, I think the confusion might be is there's right now the, the view of the streets is five or six different maps, oh, which I is totally confusing. I totally so understand. if I am, um, if I am Santa Catalina Island Company, I may want to overlay our facility, those facilities specifically. If I'm Island Rentals, I may want to overlay, um, the, here's a good place to pull over, here's a, a spot, here's a picture spot, right. here's, so well, the map itself looks the same, but but yes, each one is printing a different and map. And I now want to put my hotel on that map. And somebody else wants to put their hotel on that map. Well, I think that's that, what that the would chamber be handled does. with the Chamber that's of the Commerce. Chamber map. Chamber. That would be the Chamber's part of it. So the Chamber would do that in their map, like the like this one. That goes the pocket map. You, you participate right. by paying right. to advertise on that particular map. Somebody like the golf cart rental companies aren't going to necessarily want to put all the hotels on their map because all they their concern no. is getting, getting their person saying, safely so from they have a lot of maps floating around. Yes, but we but, already but have they, we already have a ton of maps floating right. around. That's the point. The point is is that it's a it's the mapping itself is consistent across the community, and I think that that's one of the problems because. To try and find a map that you can use to, to edit and manage for Avalon, is, it's hard. Well, what about the, what the whole thing of everybody seems to be going digital and everybody's on their these? If we didn't well, have maps to give them, aren't they all looking at their phones now? Is that better or worse no, that they the, look at their phones versus a map? But I, it's, it's kind of... I, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I guess my, what, I don't know why we're involved in this. I guess I can tell you why I'm involved, why the city's involved, because, because I want a, I want a good map for our transit, transit system, transit. Yeah. and Which I can tell you that limited. I would have never thought to go this approach until we had these focused meetings where the same right. thing from oh, every single it. participant was mapping's bad, wayfinding's bad. We need to, we need to to fix these, okay. these things. And I think if we all did it together, and then the other thing I would love to see is giving all of us the capability to do the overlays ourselves, however that would work out. So we own, the, we own the map, the map is ours, and then whoever we decide to pick to help us get through this process allows each entity to edit their map with their overlays. Because right now, if we want to do anything, we're calling a graphic designer to do it. Because mm -hmm. we don't have anybody on staff that's that has the capacity to do that. But if you have one base map and then everyone has it digitally and they can manipulate it the way they need to, I just think that it would be it would be a good thing for the whole community. It's just my personal opinion. Do we have any idea, any concept of a cartar cartographer and a, first of all, is everybody in agreement we need a cartographer and then a designer number two? Well, and what, well, a and, lot of, yeah. I, did t I did speak with Sherry Klein when she was here recently to talk to her about you know some ideas that I have because we need a new transit brochure. There's some stuff that we need that that's outdated, right. and she was going to give me a quote. I haven't got anything back from her yet, but you know there's something to be said for somebody that's lived here and understands the community. And obviously we would have to go to bid, but that's just kind of she said a cartographer is going to really map it out properly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the whole thing is going to cost that much money. I, we don't know, I mean, but we'd like to get in there and see what everyone thinks. We could have a couple of meetings and it will just go bust, but I think, it's worth, a, I think it's worth a try. Mayor? Yes. Um, I, I will throw in also that um, our Rotary Club under the presidency of Autumn Reifenschneider, her presidential project for the year was working on an ADA map and we worked with, um, I want to say, um, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to lose my train of thought. One of the colleges over town and their, um, oh my gosh, their <laughs> secondary education, their, not their bachelors, but their, um, oh. Their, um, I've completely. Yeah, masters? Their masters. Or PhD. The, I'm right. so sorry. The masters program was working to um, put together this ADA map, and so my recommendation is, um, which I'm, I'm so 
I am so engrossed in this already with Rotary and with all the stuff mm-hmm. that we've done in the past, and it's on my transportation right. low-hanging fruit list and all of that. But um, I would love to take this back to the colleges to see if we can get this put on for, um, you know, even as a project for somebody earning their bachelor's, yeah. that maybe this could be a semester project. Because I think that we have, you've built a lot of relationships with us yeah. over town now, and I think there's That would be great. I mean, I just think that getting everyone in the room and having a, a, a conversation, and um, we'd like to have a, a council member, if anybody is willing to volunteer, and then um, a member of the community at large um, would be, and then, and then the rest of the people, and then there's other people that didn't respond that I know that are interested. The hospital's interested. Um, um, I'm trying to think of who else is interested. Well, and, I, and, and then and then what? Do you charge the hospital to have a map for layover just because you're just showing them where the hospital is? I would I would suggest that the nonprofits or whatever that don't really have to pay. F- yeah, but I think their anything. input would still be valuable, yeah. Yeah. right? Oh, I, I mean, input or participation. And I think the wayfinding too, because you can see that the hospital's already put up the hospital signs that we didn't used to have, right? And on street posts that kind of give you the, the direction. But like there's not a there's not good wayfinding. I know that sounds crazy. And then having and then having consistent naming of everything. So that, so when when people change, so let's say then the hospital moves or something that might move quicker than that. But um, how do you change that? Is it a, do you go on your computer and somebody tweaks it, or I I, I, I don't know because I already thought this thought about you, the five you know, cor- about the five know. corners intersection is that it's we would not need to look like that. No, yeah. we would have to have the map updated yeah. when when that project was done. So Jim, yeah, speak to that. And there is GIS and map software. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, I've done some very rudimentary research after Audra contacted me because we were ready to go into a map redesign on our own, and so her timing was was fortuitous in that regard. And and just a a slight detour, we took a big step in this regard when we worked with Google Maps and brought the tracker here and did all the pins and fixed so many of the addresses and everything. That helped a lot. It didn't help with all the naming. We did our best to pin for the most prominent piece of signage that we could find in any given location. Uh And already since then, we've had two parks renamed I think <laughs> right. mm-hmm. um, and then we and the other thing if, if you become a Google local expert you get to create pins so now we've got people who are a Google local expert from Torrance coming here and creating local pins with wrong names so we, we took a big step and now we're dealing with <laughs> some chaos on top of that I think what we would have um, to really specifically address your question is we probably would contract with a software entity who would have the master control for moving the major entities, and then we would all have some sort of access portal for for fixing our layer, our respective okay. layers, right. is what I anticipate. That's and and there and there are companies. I sent Audra a link to one of them that that do that globally, mm-hmm. and you know so. I, until we know the prices, we don't know if we can afford them. But I know they exist as a technology. Right. And I think it's just more, you know, bring, we're, we're all, I think we all have the same common goal, which is to move people around the city in the, in the best and safest way possible. And I just, right. you well, know. And it's not a map. Huh? Then it is not a map. Because maps are what are causing the accidents. They're still pulling over. Well, know. this is true, and I don't know. But I just think if, if the maps were, I, I guess what I'm saying is that when you get on the Express and you pull, and you see them, I people are looking saying. at the maps, and they're going, oh, look at this, oh, look at that. And I then know. they get off the, the Express, and then they go to the first rental car place, and then the map that they're given looks nothing like the map that they've tried yeah. to familiarize themselves with. I just think that for such a tiny community, having this many plus probably 15 more maps is 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 confusing and I don't think it needs to be confusing I think it 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 could be simplified and so there's really no money now it's just um, a council member that's willing to uh, volunteer their time and we'll just see what happens I don't think it could hurt and mayor just to also illustrate um, when I had put together my notes for the transportation 
the one of the ideas that I'm not suggesting it is what it is because it needs to go through that the transportation review anyway but for example something that is extremely definitive for uh, golf cart rentals so whether it be this orange um, orange triangle sign that you know helps guide them right. as they're going right. up country club road and as they're coming around hogsback or, or you know that that signal is also on their particular map so they know oh there's the orange sign or, or whatever that right. sign may be exactly. whatever color so they're not looking at the map so much so they're not mm -hmm. necessarily they know right out of the gate they're looking for these waypoints and those waypoints correspond oh i'm right here easy right. move on no i, I get it yeah. totally get it if, if I could so it's that. kind of two things in one. Um, wayfinding has been an issue for a while in this community, and um, and I think if we just all work together, then maybe we could solve it without it being a huge burden on any one entity. If, if I could just say, if there is support for this, what yes. the recommended action should be is support an ad hoc committee, not form, because oh. if you form oh, right. an ad hoc oh. committee, then it's Brown Act. Okay. Oh. We'll support an ad hoc committee. <laughs> I would support, and I'd love to participate, um, but I think even two council members, if need be, but I'd love to participate. However many of you want, well, it can be two you of you, but two. Yeah. whoever wants to join, who has an interest in it. Well, I don't think we need to appoint ourselves right now. We're, not, we're just supporting that we're not forming it, so, right. so uh, we don't have to. I mean, you, you, great, you can go ahead and volunteer, and I may want to chime in later, but, but or, or whomever, or only. Um, but, okay. So is there a motion to support an ad hoc committee? I'll make a motion to support an ad hoc committee. <laughs> I'll second. Call for the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Four eyes. Oh, Good excitement. Okay. That's so cool. I'm so excited. Item about number that. 14. That would be a good thing. It's going to be a cool thing. But you, Pam. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is, I've asked um, that we just have a, a standing item on the first meeting of each month so that I can report out if there's any activity that the public should be aware of regarding the Edison's proposal to increase our water rates. We did have a, a large meeting, another meeting with them, with the um, various um, camps, the Conservancy, the Island Company, the city, of course. Um, other interested um, representatives, the chamber, with um, Edison, they've pretty much um, decided on an approach that um, doesn't seem to really provide much in return to the city for giving up what appear to be significant um, procedural protections um, that I discussed before about having an administrative law judge, but nevertheless, we continue to have discussions with them. We have another, um, just our own water group meeting uh, September 17th or 19th um, coming up, and I'll report out then in October where we are. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, now we're going and, to, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Hospital. Oh, hospital. Yeah, that's. I, mm -hmm. we, we need to report out at this meeting that we'll be attending the League of California Cities Conference. Is that correct? Well, I'm going. As individuals, I think we already not. did. Right. I think we did. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I just I want to make sure that's discussed. Yeah. Okay. And now we will have a uh, the Avalon Municipal House Board of Trustees in lieu of um, oh. chair, chairman, chairman Olson. I think I'm the vice chair. So we will <laughs> call the meeting now. to order. You are now. Roll call, please. <laughs> Trustee Albers here. Trustee Hernandez? Here. Trustee Cassidy? Here. Acting Chairman Marshall? Here. Are there any announcements? I have none. Are there any written communications? None. <laughs> Are there any presentations? I have none. Oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the public uh, to address the city, to the city council, not the city council, to the hospital at this time. No action will be taken and speakers will be limited to three minutes. And then in the spirit of Oli, it says, they're flocking to the podium. <laughs> so that's why I was giggling through this whole thing. Okay, the consent calendar. We have two items on the consent calendar. The first one is actions from the August 7th um, Avalon Municipal Hospital Board of Trustees meeting. The second one is just to make a recommendation of reappointing Judy Greer and Trudy Saldana to sit on the board of directors 
for a three-year term. This will be their second term. Okay. Council? I mean, uh, hospital. I'll make a motion to approve consent calendar items one and two. Second. <laughs> Any comment? I would like to comment about one of the comments that was in uh, the applicant, Judy Greer. All of these jobs have helped me find ways to get things done. Try telling a roaring drunk he's been 86. <laughs> <laughs> that was in her application. I didn't happen to read that. Anyway, moved and seconded. No further comments. Call for the vote. Four eyes. Right. Welcome back. Thank you, Trudy and Judy, for your yeah. service Thank you. to your Thank community. You. Okay, yep. and now we have a closed session. Yeah, we are going to have three closed sessions. We're not going into closed session on number two. We don't have a quorum for that on number one. It's uh, anticipated litigation. This is to discuss a threat of litigation from Associated Pacific Contractors. They're the people that built the fuel dock. Um, we're also going to have uh, two closed sessions on public employment. Employment, um, the titles of assistant city manager or senior management analyst, and senior accountant or lead senior accountant. Okay, great. All right, we shall return.
And we are, we are back from closed session. And there was no reportable action. Okay, we would like to say good night, Tony. Good night, Tony. Good night, Tony. Meeting adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Dudley.